Agent and I discussed the best way to move Jane into the hangar, where the medical treatment room had been constructed. She had a mule drive up to the rear cargo ramp while I dragged the mostly deflated mattress back through the aircraft and onto the ramp. I stood back as she raised the tail ramp up a bit to match the level of the mule's deck, and I simply pulled the mattress and Jane onto the mule. I then followed as Agent drove the mule into the hangar and towards the back of the building. There I found the medical treatment room. It basically was a large white plastic tent with sliding doors and contained two rooms, each about the size of a normal hospital room. We entered the first which I found was a prep or cleanup room of some sort. In the middle of the prep room was a low basin table. John, please disrobe and shower fully, scrubbing and using the soap provided in the shower compartment. Then don the gown and footwear hanging in the receptacle beside the shower, agent instructed. I did so and was impressed that the shower compartment had a built-in warm air dryer. After I dressed, agent continued, remove the infuser, mask, goggles, and undergarment from Jane and place her into the basin. She had wet the diaper, which I thought was a good indication that her kidneys were functioning. Next, carefully remove the sedation patch on her neck without touching its underside and dispose of it in the refuse container below the basin. The wounds on her body looked better, but some were still weeping, a smelly grayish discharge which I mentioned to Agent. The nanospray previously applied requires that the wounds remain open to allow for the residue of the infection and the parasites to drain. They will begin to close after the next few treatments. I carefully picked up Jane and set her in the middle of the basin. A curved metal support rose from the basin floor to support her head and neck. The basin started filling with a milky liquid which rose slowly around Jane until just her face remained above the surface. Agent had me take a cloth and wash and wipe down her face with the milky liquid. Bubbles began to agitate the liquid, and I could see the open wounds leaking more dark seepage. Jane will need to remain in the cleansing bath for approximately a quarter hour, John. Please discard your soiled gown and wash completely in the shower compartment a second time. Then don the gown, sterile gloves, and face mask in the next cabinet. Apply the gloves last, Agent explained. I saw a cabinet door opening beside a small wash compartment and went to clean up and get dressed in the indicated items. When I was scrubbed, masked, gowned, and hopefully, now more sterile, I returned to the basin to see that Jane was now immersed in a clear water-like liquid. Using a new towel, please wipe her exposed face with cleansing liquid, John. The liquid had an astringent smell and soon after began to drain from the basin. A mobile unit pulling a wheeled metal table entered from the second room and stopped next to the basin. Place Jane onto her right side on the mobile table, John. I again had no problem picking up Jane and carefully placed her on the center of the absorbent pad on the table. The mobile unit took Jane into the second room. Please remain outside the sterile procedure room, John. You may monitor the various procedures and surgeries on the wall screen if you wish, agent said. Over the next hour, I went from fascinated and mesmerized to slightly horrified to finally just bored as I watched agents various machines and manipulators working on Jane. In the procedure room, the table was placed among a dozen various manipulator arms, probes, scanners, and more devices, which I had no idea about. She was intubated, catheterized, fitted to a new infuser, and finally rolled onto her front as various small probes and manipulators worked on her back and spine. Agent kept me updated on what was happening and was almost certain that Jane would be fully healed after treatment. I finally left the medical suite when Agent admitted that she no longer needed me to remain on standby and that Jane would be in the procedure room under sedation for at least the next two days to give the repairs done to her spine and spinal column a chance to stabilize. I ditched the gown, gloves, and mask and went back out into the hangar. Flipper had been wheeled into the hangar and I found new clothing in one of the crates and after dressing, helped unload and stow the gear until late in the afternoon. I asked Agent where I would be spending the night and she said that temporary quarters had been prepared for me in the power kite hangar building. I walked over to the other end of the landing area where the kite hangar building resided. Inside was another plastic tenant room about the size of a large bedroom and next to that was a temporary bathroom complete with a shower stall. I saw that there were a few crates by the door to the room and found new clothing, hygiene supplies, and a container of drinking water. I was pleased to note that the sleeping tent was fully heated and air-conditioned.
I asked agent about food and she said that I could order whatever I liked at any time. The items would be delivered from the sub-level below by a mechanical unit in under an hour. I thought about what I was hungry for and decided to tempt fate and ordered a grilled ribeye steak, medium rare, a baked potato with sour cream and butter, thick garlic toast, and a cold pilsner in a frosted mug. The meal will be ready in 52 minutes, John. The hell she said. I had my doubts, but I'd give her the benefit of doubt. The delay would give me enough time for a long hot shower. 40 minutes later, I was relaxed, dressed, and getting hungry for my steak. I wondered if there were ration bars handy in case the steak turned out to be a disaster. Inside the tent-like room, I found a twin-sized inflatable mattress on one side and a table and chair on the other. The room was cool and dry with fresh air supplied by a small grill high on one wall. I noticed a view screen and asked how Jane was doing, and her image appeared showing her still being worked on, although she was now back on her side again. It looked like they were finishing up the surgeries and applying another type of nanospray to the open wounds. This spray hardened and remained in place, forming a dressing of sorts. The room's door slid open and a mobile unit rolled in carrying a metal serving container and a box which looked like a small cooler. I began salivating when it opened the serving container and I smelled the meal. I placed the food on my table and found inside the cooler box a frosty mug of beer. I took a big drink and it tasted good. I would not miss the powdered beer. I found the eating utensils beside the container and got busy buttering and topping my baked potato, hoping it was as good as it smelled. I cut my first piece of steak and held it up inspecting it on the fork. It looked like a real steak, so I decided to go for it. It was above average with a good flavor and texture. I was impressed. The baked potato and toast also hit the spot. Of course, for all I knew, Agent could have conditioned me during biosuspension to like roadkill but at least I was now full and satisfied. Desert appeared when another mobile unit appeared with a basket of fruit. I recognized the bananas, but the other two were a mystery. Agent explained that they were local fruit that she had harvested just this morning. Besides the bananas, the other two items of fruit were mangoes and something called a sapodilla. I tried one of each and found the sapodilla to be very sweet. I had planned to go for a quick walk around to see the basin area but after the meal, the fast pace of the past three days caught up to me and I decided to just go to bed. It was wonderful to awaken when my body was fully ready and rested. I lay on the mattress, luxuriating in the peace and quiet of the cool, dim tent. Soon my bladder made me get up and I hobbled out of the tent in my underwear, heading to the small bathroom. I followed that with another long, hot shower and returned to the tent to find Agent had left me a breakfast of fruit, cereal, and cold milk. There was a carafe, so I finished with a cup of hot coffee. How's Jane doing? Jane's treatment is concluded, and she is now recovering. She will remain sedated for the next 30 hours or so, upon which I will allow her to awaken as her energy levels permit, Agent replied. What time is it? It is 8.46 in the morning, Saturday, February 20th, 2602, John. Agent knew I like to keep track of the day of the week for some reason. So Jane will be out of it at least until late afternoon tomorrow? Affirmative, John. It was warm and sunny when I left the power kite hangar. On the landing pad area, I noticed that there were just the three aircraft tied down in a row and that all the spare cargo and empty ESUs had been removed. I went into the main hangar and retrieved my knife and goggles from Flipper as I was going to take a look around the compound and the surrounding area. I asked Agent about any dangerous animals in the area and found that jaguars and pumas did travel the area but that I needed to mainly watch for the Ferdalon snake. The poisonous snake existed in large numbers in the jungles nearby, but that agent monitored the landing area and hangars keeping a watch for them. As far as the big cats, she said that they had been spotted occasionally, but that her heat detectors would see them if they approached the area. I found that the jungle behind the hangars was actually a large garden, which had been planted by agent over the decades. Her mobile units had been growing many types of plant species and had been transplanting them all around Central America. I found more ripe fruit on some of the trees and had a snack. The trees were filled with birds and I saw various type of monkeys and even a tree sloth. I also noticed that plenty of insects had survived and wondered if Agent would have a deterrent available. I was getting hot as it was quite warm and muggy. Agent had said that this was the dry season, 
but that it still rained occasionally, and the highs reached to around 3035C, 8595F during the day. I mentioned I would need shorts. I returned to the main hangar around 10 o'clock and was again glad my quarters were air conditioned to remove the humidity. I looked in on Jane and she had been moved to a standard inflatable bed and was sleeping quietly with only a few medical monitors present. I was almost bored with nothing to do and no urgent mission to complete. I mentioned this to Agent and she suggested I take a quick vacation. She recommended I take one of the aircraft outside and fly over to the coast and out to that island we had passed and spend the afternoon and night on the beach. It would be cooler off the coast and she could even provide provisions and fishing gear. I thought about this for a while and decided it was a great idea, as Jane would be out of it until tomorrow afternoon. Corn Island was only 20 minutes away by air so I could return quickly if needed at any time. Agent said that she would have supplies and provisions ready by 1150. While I waited, I used a mule to haul a few of the crates with some of the camping type gear to one of the planes outside which I learned was Shadow. The aircraft had had fresh ESUs installed yesterday and its water tank was full. I stowed the gear and went to the other hangar to get some clothing and hygiene supplies, eating a quick lunch while I was there. At 12 o'clock noon, Agent's mobile unit met me back at the plane with the new gear. She had made a set of fishing rods which were disassembled at the moment I also found a pair of shorts, a wide-brimmed hat, and a pair of swim fins. Agent said that the goggles and respirator mask were waterproof and would function as basic diving gear if I wanted to go snorkeling, although she advised me to not go more than 5 meters deep and that I should watch for dangerous fish. The work unit also had a medium-sized chest which I discovered was a self-contained cooler unit. There were generically labeled beverages a couple sandwiches, and what looked like large hot dogs. I saw that there were two long skewer forks so I could cook over a fire if I wanted. I saw the skewers had small barbs and I hoped to use them to find a lobster to enjoy for supper. I was fretting over what more to bring when agent reminded me that there were two other aircraft here and that I would only be a half hour away from resupply if I needed something else. Okay, I got the hint and boarded the aircraft. Soon we were flying 300 kph due east, and I had barely gotten comfortable in the still shrink wrap pilot's seat when I saw the island on the horizon. It was kidney bean shaped and about five kilometers long and two wide. We descended towards the southwest corner where a wide sandy beach extended for almost a kilometer. This side of the island faced the mainland 65 kilometers away and was more protected from the Caribbean Sea. With a spray of sand, Shadow set down a dozen meters from the tree line. From the driftwood on the beach, it looked like we would be high enough above the waterline to not have to worry about tides or any sudden storms. I undressed and just put on the shorts, kneading its pockets for my knife and tablet, and hit the beach. It was partly cloudy and warm, with a gentle breeze blowing away from shore and the ocean was just gentle waves lapping the sand. Agent would inform me via the tablet if the sensors on Shadow detected anything I needed to worry about. She had also launched the drone that would monitor the area if I wandered too far away. I spent the next hour just walking the beach and enjoying the sand between my toes. The beach was in its natural state, so there was plenty of driftwood and other items interrupting the fine sand. I noticed quite a bit of rubbish still washing ashore, although it was all heavily eroded and degraded. There were plenty of signs of beach life with turtle, bird, and other tracks peppering the sand. I found a large straight stick and whittled a point on one end in case a jungle rat or pig or something attempted to see if I was tasty. I reasoned that all of nature had lost its fear of humans, so I would be wary. I returned to the aircraft and got the goggles, face mask, and swim fins, strapping the air unit on my upper arm. Agent advised me to wear a pair of socks as a precaution in case of jellyfish or other spiny water life in the shallows. She said the soles would resist punctures quite well. The water was incredible, and I spent over an hour just slowly swimming back and forth watching the bottom. I did not dive more than a few meters as the pressure on my face from the goggles and breathing mask was uncomfortable. I'd have to have Agent construct a proper set of snorkel gear if I wanted to do this again in the future. Hell, I smiled when I realized that I could have a set of full scuba gear made and have her teach me to properly dive if I wanted. Or even a small submarine, I'd have to start thinking differently about my wants and needs in this new world. Around 15 o'clock, I returned to the aircraft and exchanged the swimming gear 
for a tarp and a beer from the cooler. I spent the next hour just lying on the beach on the tarp. I did not burn as a cream agent had included worked well as a sunblock. I lay there relaxing and enjoying the peace. I was both happy and sad at the same time. I was happy to be alive and in such a beautiful place, but sad that I was alone with no one else to share this with. My thoughts revolved around a Jane and I found myself wondering what it would be like to be around another living human being again. Would we get along? Were we supposed to go off in the jungle somewhere and Adam and Eve ourselves up a quick new family? Did I even want a new family? I thumbed the ring on my finger as I thought. What had I expected I would be doing as one of the few remaining humans on the planet? Continue sitting on the sidelines as a recluse? I was getting hungry and used that as an excuse to stop brooding. I got up and considered my supper plans. I could eat what was in the cooler or I could try and find a meal. I had noticed fruit trees in the jungle off the beach and spotted what looked to be citrus of various forms. If they were citrus, then they should be decently ripe at this time of year. I had seen an abundance of fish, crabs, and even a lobster in the water, but I did not have a lobster trap. I decided to try the fishing gear, so I went and retrieved the rod and looked over the basic metal spoons and jigs that Agent had provided as lures. I waded in the warm water up to my thighs and started casting. The tackle was some sort of spinning reel, but it worked well enough and was similar to that which I had used in the past. Soon, I had the hang of it and was tossing the spoon pretty far out into the lagoon. I was wearing the goggles so the filters would reduce the sun's glare and help me see under the water. I was reeling in the spoon when a strike happened so quickly and surprisingly that I almost dropped the rod. I was ready for the next strike though and set the hook hard. Fish on, it was a monster and I felt the adrenaline rush. I fought the fish for the next 20 seconds, noticing that it was shrinking in status fast the closer I got it to shore. I soon landed a silver fish that was only about a foot long. So much for being a monster, I asked Agent what kind of fish it was as I held it up and turned it around, giving the goggle camera a good view. I believe that is a juvenile specimen of Albula vulpes, also known as a bonefish. Is it good to eat? I asked. The species possesses a large number of small bones, hence its name, and consumption is not recommended. Okay, back you go, little fella. Grow up to be the monster I had imagined. I resumed fishing and over the next 15 minutes caught two more bonefish or maybe the same one as they were all about the same size. I walked down the beach a bit and tried again and soon got another strike. This fish fought harder and was a bit bigger at almost 60 centimeters long. Agents said that it was a pompano and that it was commonly eaten. I had the start of my supper. I took the fish back to the aircraft and filleted it with the long thin blade of my folding knife. I figured there was a good pound of fillets which I placed into a clear bag and into the cooler. Now I needed some garnishments and went into the jungle. I found a lemon tree which still had lemons hanging and picked a few that might work with the fish. I also found a few papayas which should go good with the lemon. On my way back to the aircraft I noticed a banana tree and grabbed a few large decent leaves, ignoring the green bananas. I cut up the fruit and placed them into a second bag in the cooler. On the beach I found plenty of driftwood and gathered enough for a fire which I soon had burning. I piled on the wood and would leave it burning for an hour to get a good bed of coals. In the meantime, I set up a tarp and tent on the higher part of the beach for later. That done, I went to prep the meal and from the provisions crate I grabbed salt and what I hoped was hot sauce, it was. I did not have butter or oil, so I hoped the papaya would fill in for both and mix the spices into the bag. I spread the papaya and lemon salsa mixture onto the fillets and wrapped them with the banana leaves tying them with wet strands of coconut fiber. At the fire, I prepared a bed of coals with the folding shovel and placed the leaf bundles on them to cook. I sat back and popped open a beer and hoped for the best, knowing that I had sandwiches as a backup if my attempt at a shoreline cooked fish supper failed. After five or six minutes, I used the gloves to quickly flip the bundles and cook the other side for five more before pulling them off the fire and leaving them on the sand to finish cooking. I plated one bundle and worked the charred banana leaf wrapping open with a fork. The aroma of the fruit-coated fish was wonderful. And like most meals you had to work for, the flaky meat tasted delicious. Dessert was a sour but fresh lemon and salt with a beer chaser. The sun had just set and I went for a quick swim to scrub the smell of fishing 
and cooking off before enjoying a nice fresh hot water rinse from the shower hose outside the aircraft cabin. I returned to the fire and sat enjoying the twilight, listening to the waves and the jungle noises. Agent, what do you have in mind for Jane and me? I would advise that you both return to biosuspension, John. The planet has not stabilized fully, and there are still many problems with the current ecology. The environmental toxin and radiation levels are still elevated and pose a significant risk to long-term health, Agent explained. I considered that. The alternate would be to carve out a place to live now. I would still be dependent upon Agent for many things if that were the plan. Would Jane cooperate? For that matter, would Agent cooperate? Where would we re-enter biosuspension? I asked. I had intended for you to return to the field base in Tennessee, John. Jane would be placed in biosuspension at the base in Mexico, as there is a second empty medical crash at that base. I had been thinking about the base here, but Agent's explanation must mean that there was only one unit here in Nicaragua. And since it was currently occupied, Jane would have to go to Mexico. The four aircraft here would be utilized to transport both you and Jane to the base in Mexico, and after placing her in biosuspension there, you would then travel on to Tennessee using Flipper and Shadow, Agent continued. I was hesitant and unsure of the plan. I could see the logic in waiting till a further time as the planet would be further healed. Agent had indicated that once it began active and aggressive cleanup efforts, the toxins and radiation levels would most likely spike. It was not as if I'd be missing anything while I slept. On the other hand, exploring and living in the current world had an appeal also, especially if I was going to be sharing the time with someone. I'd have to speak to her about this. I remembered her terror when she had awoken, and she might have issues with my company. As I continued to mull over my options, I relaxed back onto the tarp and stargazed, noting that the now normal frequent meteors rivaled any meteor shower I had ever seen in the past. Sleeping in the tent was tranquil. I had awoken only once when Agent turned on Shadow's landing lights and used a focused heat beam from the spotlight to discourage the approach of some jungle critter, but the rest of the night was peaceful. I woke before the sun cleared the jungle and got up to go to the aircraft to make myself a cup of coffee. I dressed in shorts along with my normal shirt and socks and including my boots, I hiked to the north end of the beach where a small town had once been located. The jungle had reclaimed much of the town remains, but I could still see signs of old masonry walls and concrete paved areas. I had thought about making my way towards the central hill, which stood over the island, but decided that instead of hacking my way, thought the jungle, that I would just take shadow. Back at the aircraft, I took a quick swim, followed by a shower, and loaded the gear, getting the aircraft ready for departure. I flew Shadow on manual around the island and could see where the old airport had been located by the discolored strip in the jungle. Near the central hill, which I'd read, was named Mount Pleasant, I found a clearing big enough for the aircraft and sat down. After exiting Shadow, I hiked a few hundred meters to the peak of the hill. There, I found the remains of an old radio tower foundation and used that as a platform to survey my island. I recorded a few minutes of imagery, returned to shadow, and took off to search the northern parts of the island. Here the beaches were narrower and the waves larger as they broke over the large reef surrounding the island. I looked for a place to land, but did not see an area large enough to risk it, and instead accelerated out over the ocean. To the north, about 10 kilometer away, was a second smaller island called Little Corn Island. This one had also been inhabited back when but had seen far less tourism than the bigger island. In a few minutes, I was approaching the breakers and slowed finding a wide beach that looked better than the one I had spent the previous night on. I crossed over the narrow island and set shadow down on a beach on the eastern shore. Here the sounds of the surf were much greater as I now faced the open Caribbean. I got the fishing gear ready and headed to the surf to start casting. I had fun for the next hour and a half catching some nice sized fish but releasing them. My breakfast had been the sausage in the cooler and the sandwich would be my lunch, so fish was off the menu for today. At noon, I decided to wrap up my mini vacation and head back to the field base. I ate my sandwich and enjoyed a cold bottle of juice on the 25 minute flight back to the mainland. As we flew east over the ocean, I thought I saw something splash in the water below. I asked Agent if she had noticed the splash with the aircraft cameras. I believe that was a whale, she replied. Oh, whales survived, 
I exclaimed. Yes, during recent ocean surveys, my hydrophones have detected the songs and sonar emanations from many whale and dolphin species, Agent explained. Huh, knowing whales survive made me happy for some reason. We had detoured slightly to the south on our flight to overfly a large bay in which the former city of Bluefield had been located. Bluefield had been a city of around 90,000 and had once been the capital of the, of the Mosquito Coast. I approached from the east and passed the coastal peninsula of El Bluff and then over the large muddy brown harbor. There were a few stone or concrete wharfs still visible protruding into the harbor, many with rusty hulks laying nearby. Deeper into the city, I came upon a large hill covered with thousands of white monuments, gravestones. For some reason, I was curious and landed Shadow in a clearing nearby to take a quick hike to investigate the cemetery. Most of the stones were too weathered to make out, but I could read the dates on the smaller fallen stones after I flipped them over. I found a few that dated back to the early 19th century, which would have put them at near 800 years old. I was sitting on a stone at the top of the hill enjoying the sunshine and the view when Agent spoke up from my tablet. John, Jane is awake, and I am in communication with her. What? When did she wake up? I asked, surprised. Agent hesitated for a bit. She awoke early this morning. She was quite upset initially, but I am now able to communicate with her. It was almost 13 o'clock hours. Why was I just learning this now? Why did you not tell me right away? I asked. She was not lucid until recently, and had to be mildly sedated. She remains quite upset, and I predict that she will not wish you to approach her at this time. Therefore, I delayed informing you to allow you to better enjoy the day, Agent explained. Why? What is wrong with her? She is confused about what has happened and how she got here. Also, she seems to have suffered trauma before entering biosuspension and is wary of your presence. I am attempting to explain things and calm her, but she seems to be suffering from paranoia, Agent explained. What have you learned about her? Did you learn her name? I asked. Her real name is Anna Branco, and she was 36 years old when she entered biosuspension. I returned to the aircraft and told Agent to fly us back to the base. While we flew, Agent continued to update me on Jane, um, Anna's background. Agent had been able to learn some things about her past and how she had ended up at the base. She had been born as a member of an indigenous Amazonian tribe in western part of the state of Acre, Brazil, and her tribe had lived in a small village on a tributary of the upper river Purus. Her full birth name was Shana Kayani Kachinawa, and when she was 11, she had moved with her family to a developed community downriver and was educated in a Catholic school where she took her Christian name of Ana. She later studied biology and ecology at the Federal University of Rondonia outside of Porto Velo on the Madeira River in the northwest state of Rondonia, Brazil. Upon graduation, she had married and become Ana Branco. The couple had had no children and she taught at the university. Agent also learned she speaks her native language and Portuguese, but does not apparently speak English. I will have to translate if you wish to speak with her, John. I thought you conditioned all the other humans in suspension to be comfortable speaking English, I asked. Agent hesitated a bit. I am not sure why she has not been conditioned to prefer English, John. It may be that she can speak it and is choosing to not do so, or it may be that she cannot speak English. Either way, much of what happened at that base towards the end is obscure to me. Tell her I will be there in 15 minutes, Agent, I said as we rapidly flew south low over the jungle.